Well, when we think about stretching uh, and we, we equate it to the delayed onset of muscle stiffness, we really have to take into account uh, what we've done in our training and conditioning program uh, to actually get soreness. And a lot of times soreness is a mechanical breakdown in the muscle structures, but it's also a mechanical breakdown within the connective tissue as well. And if we have enough mechanical breakdown in the tissues, then we're going to stimulate some nociceptive responses. And so nociceptors are little are receptors within the body that are pain receptors. And if we stretch, sometimes we numb those pain receptors. Sometimes we get a massage, we numb the pain receptors. So to say that it gets rid of the soreness, it may, but there's still an underlining mechanical uh, mechanical distortion in the pattern. We're still getting some mechanical damage to the system. And if it is a low grade tissue breakdown, then we've got good adaptations. If it's a high degree of tissue breakdown, that could actually lead to injuries. So to decrease the soreness may not necessarily alleviate the mechanical breakdown that our body experiences. And that's really one thing that we need to distinguish is that pain, if we numb it, doesn't mean that the problem or the damage has gone away. And our nutrition, uh, our movement strategies, our periodization programs, all will ensure that the tissue breakdown that we have can be accommodated correctly by the body instead of having this one on top of the other breakdown that leads to tissue fatigue and tissue injury. And so we need to think about what we're doing, how much stress we're applying to the system and if stretching is diminishing the pain response, we still have to be aware that there's still mechanical breakdown in the system. Uh, if we're going to do a lot of plyometric efforts and we get a lot of tissue breakdown, what we want to avoid is a lot of big range of motion stretching that takes us into areas or ranges of motion that may put a more mechanical tension on an already taxed structure or the rate of loading in terms of stretching may be important. In other words, if I'm bouncing and ballistically stretching, that's going to put a lot of uh, tissue impact or mechanical load into the tissues as well. So it really depends on what I've done uh, leading up to this and why I'm choosing the stretching protocols that I'm choosing. A lot of times what we do is movement-based flexibility measures because it's teaching the nervous system, it's teaching the muscular system to properly adapt and control the motion, but it also teaches the fascial system a good way of actually receiving the load so that it's not too quick and it's not too, uh, too short, because if it's or too long rather, because if it's too long and lengthened, you're going to get this plastic deformation, which may not be the best thing that we want. So longer duration stretching will lead to plastic deformation. And we've got to make sure that if we've got a lot of plastic deformation, that we don't have an instability because of that. In all the research I've ever looked at, that would be a myth. Uh, what we do is, is stretching will actually allow the connective tissue the ability to extend and within the connective tissue we've got the muscular system but to say that we're longer and leaner well leaner is a function of how much body fat we're carrying and longer muscles in itself is a measure of how much extensibility we have so we do want to stretch but something that equates stretching with longer and leaner muscles I've never seen any research that correlates those two together Static stretching, if you hold a stretch for a long period of time, expect that what you're stretching is not the muscles, but the surrounding elements that encapsulate the muscles, like your collagen, which is fascia. And if you sustain a stretch for a long period of time, let's say 20 seconds or more, you're going to have a low grade and a long duration stretch, which is going to lead to plastic deformation. So in fascia, you have something called a fascial creep, where you start to actually get into the deformation, the plastic deformation elements of the fascia. It's kind of like saying I'm going to put my fist in a plastic bag, and I'm going to slowly push on that plastic bag over time. Eventually, I'm going to take my fist out, and there's still going to be an imprint of my fist in that plastic bag because I've deformed the tissues. 
So if my goal is to get some extensibility over a long time and actually get some fascial extensibility, I may choose a lower grade, longer duration stretch. However, if I do that, I may in an acute way, in a short term, that may lead to an instability in the system because I'm starting to stretch the bag, so to speak, bigger. So now I'm creating some instability. So if my nervous system is, is well functioning and it's, it's well trained and my muscular system is well trained, I can slowly over time get some of that plastic deformation and actually create some extensibility in my body, which is a good thing. A faster way to stretch is going to be more of an elastic response in through the, the fascia itself. So you're actually gonna teach the fascia to be more elastic and more um, compliant when it comes to almost like an elastic band. You're actually gonna stretch it and you're gonna create that elastic response and through the fascia. So for a lot of athletes, that's pr precisely what they want. They want their tissues to capture energy and release it right away so that they can actually get more efficient, more effective at producing results. So faster stretching protocols is going to net a more dynamic response in through the tissues in this case the fascia. So that would behoove a runner to be able to go gradually into a more speed element of a stretch. But we've got to make sure that we don't do too much too soon.